Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Our third session for the day is a panel titled States of Exception and States of Emergency, Art and Visual Culture Since 1970s. And it's a pleasure to welcome Patrick Flores, Professor of Art Studies, University of the Philippines, Anthony Gardner, Professor of Contemporary Art History, the Ruskin School of Art, University of Oxford, Atri Gupta, Assistant Professor of Global Modern Art, Modern Contemporary South and Southeast, Southeast Asian Art, Berkeley, and Anissa Rahadin Tias, Assistant Curator, National Gallery of Singapore. The session is moderated by Iftikhar Dadi, John H. Buris Professor in History of Art, Cornell University. Each of the panelists will present first, followed by a moderated discussion and a brief audience q and I'll hand it over to the panel. Thank you, Maria, for the introduction. And I'd like to thank the Sharjah Art Foundation for this uh, invitation and also the hospitality. <clears throat> the, the brief of this panel prompts us to reflect on a perceived paradox oscillating between the exceptional dispossession of a multitude and the exceptional emergence of what may well be a counter conjuncture. It is a complex signal one that takes us to the problem of what constitutes a desiccated and an auspicious condition and therefore produces a kind of an equivalently paradoxical practicality, nothing less than the problematic of the time. I speak to this prompt by recalling my work um, with Okwi Envisor at the Guangzhou Biennale in 2008 in which I curated for the position paper section an exhibition titled, oh sorry, an exhibition titled uh, Turns in Tropics, Artist Curator. The phrase seeking to mark a shift in trope from the legible rubrics of artistry and curation, uh, it moves by itself, sorry. Uh, uh, the legible rubrics of artistry and curation, or artist and curator, to the hyphenated, if not supplemental, artist curator. The trope, of course, is already a turn of phrase in language, so turns in tropics would also suggest a series of turns in both material and effort, and also location, which is uh, the tropics, the tropical being a place and a poetics under the ages of relations in the spirit of Edouard Glissant. In Guangzhou, I presented the work of uh, Jim Supankat of Indonesia, Red Sapiadasa of Malaysia, Raimundo Albano of the Philippines, and Apinan Poshonanda of Thailand. By work, I meant their art, the documentation of their exhibitions and their textual production. The term artist curator might be ultimately imprecise because built into this permutation are the multiple interests of interpretation and translation, criticism, theory, journalism, polemics, activism, and the related instincts of intervention and survival. Or it might be, in the same breath, extensively clear, in the sense that these instincts altogether reconstitute what it takes to be an artist or curator in the 70s and 80s in Southeast Asia, to some extent anticipating the contemporary by irritating the self-righteous uh, vanguardism or the vanguardist rectitude of, of the modern. So some uh, scenes of the of, of that exhibition in Guangzhou, the work of Jim Sopankat, of Red Sepia Dasa, of Raimundo Albano, and uh, Apinan Poshananda. Okwi in Guangzhou offered the material condition of the Biennale for this historiography to register its energy, dramatizing the urgency of the site in Guangzhou in 1980 in relation to its uh, hegemonic European coordinate in Paris in 1968. According to Okwi, and I quote him, <clears throat> these two events then in May 1968 and May 1980 provide a study in contrast in the uses and politics of spectacle while the spectacle of May 68 is today a totem of leftist nostalgia, the May 18 spectacle has a different sociopolitical purchase. I would argue that the continuous cultural uses of these instances of political spectacle demonstrate two divergent 
relationships to the social motivations of spectacle. May 68 is often read in tradition, in the tradition of Western avant-garde practices of instantaneous shock, rupture, and attack on the legitimacy of prevailing political orders, social norms, and aesthetic logics. For May 18, the kernel of its radical reform is not embedded in the tradition of an aesthetic renewal of decayed institutions. Rather, it was motivated by a tradition of post-colonial cultural resistance and the collectivized vision of a common politics. The configuration of this collectivized vision has been described by the political theorist Choi Jung Woon as the formation of an absolute community undefined, end of quote. The four artist curators performed certain gestures that responded to the avant-garde, even as they disrupted the dominance of the Western and the modern and the technologies producing attendant political bureaucracies like the nation state, the museum, and the art school, the institutions of tradition and the industries of heritage, and the modes of economic production that ensured inequality. These figures were initially artists drawn to variations of modernism and conceptualism and deemed it necessary to materialize their own labors and those of others, historicize themselves in discourse, critique institutions, prefigure a reflexive institutionality and intermittent authority, and speak on behalf of localities and interlocal assemblies like Binales. They were, in other words, translatable and translating agents who may have unhinged the modern from its repeating obsessions and release it to the lively mingling of the contemporary. That some of these curators, notably um, Supankat and Piedasa, were involved in the crafting and circulation of manifestos versus state-sustained discriminations provided another dimension of plurality via the polytropic artist curator. This is the, the manifesto of uh, Piedasa. I play out the tropic moment of the artist curator in this session as a way to converse with Okwi's notions of adjacency and intense proximity, concepts that prominently attended his uh, curatorial arguments for the Sevilla Biennale in 2007 and the La Triennale in Paris in 2012. In contradistinction to the rupture of the avant-garde, the artist curator may have demonstrated a post-colonial imbrication or co-implication that harnessed alternations within a mutable system instead of affirming a decolonial separation from the dominant apparatus. Swinging back and forth between these tendencies, the artist curator generated sufficient worldliness to be able to challenge the expectation of what it means to be present and be represented in a world that is un unhomely. Okwe's title of this of his binale in Sevilla, an idiosyncratic evocation of the uncanny or the a haunting affinity, or what he phrased as consisting of phantom scenes in global society. I wish to loop uh, this reflection on the artist curator into my recent research in Germany on the engagement of the uh, German expressionists, both the Die Brücke and the Der Blau writer, Coteris, with ethnographic materials from the Pacific colonies of Germany, including artifacts from Indonesia. This is another inflection of worldliness that takes us back to artistic modernism and to Okwi as well, who in La Trinale in Paris revisited, I quote him, the poetics of ethnography and with it the seminal Tristropique of Claude Levi Strauss, which for him revealed, and I quote, that within the boundaries of ethnography, we have what I would call constant co-discovery and not just discovery, end of quote. The latter may well have been an investigative habitus in the modality of bricolage, a concept explicated in the same book of Levi Strauss. The German expressionists beginning in the 1920s looked to the Pacific and by extension Austronesia to recover a humanism enervated by industrialization or to tap another vein of uh, productivity. This site, guys, became quite clear in recent thoughtful curatorial efforts at the Brücke Museum in Berlin and the Lenbach House in Munich, custodians of the German Expressionist Corpus, and some, just some scenes of the Die Brücke Museum, the Brücke Museum in Berlin, and then the, the, the recent hang of the uh, Expressionist work 
uh, in that museum. Uh, here. And the Lenbach House in Munich with the exhibition of Der Blau Reiter. Um, <clears throat> Such expressionist aspiration required a different collective imaginary, which led to the accumulation of ethnic objects by artists like Karl schmidt rottluff uh, Emil Nold, and Vasily Kandinsky, and the composition of an almanac by the Derblau writer, which included Alexei von Jaulensky, Gabriele Munter, Franz Mark, and August Mack. Both the Derblau writer and the Die Brücke, which counted Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, uh, Eric Heckel, and Max Pechstein as luminaries, cultivated the virtues of originality. Oh, I don't know what happened. Sorry. Did I do anything? Oh. Anyway, cultivated um, the virtues of originality of expression, authenticity, and diversity of procedures. And the Der Blau writer insisted on, and I quote, the equal status of works of art produced around the world, end of quote, because all would evince the Kandinskyan inner necessity. Yeah, are we back on that? Yeah. So just uh, maybe this is the almanac of the Der Blau writer, and uh, these are pages from the almanac, mm, and some scenes from the exhibition uh, showing the influence of the Eastern, East Asian woodblocks. Uh, um, reverse glass paintings from Bavaria uh, and others. And also children's art. Um, the uh, almanac of the Der Blau writer published in 1912 interspersed images of folk and indigenous art from geographies like Sri Lanka and New Caledonia, art by children, carvings from Africa, Asia, and Polynesia, Bavarian reverse glass paintings, East Asian prints, works by European masters, contemporary art, and the music of Richard Wagner and Arnold Schoenberg, and Kandinsky's own Gestamp-Kunstwerk. Kandinsky and Mark would argue that it should Kandinsky and Mark would argue that it should be almost superfluous, and I quote them, to specifically emphasize that in our case, the principle of internationalism is the only one possible. The whole body of work we call art knows neither borders nor nations, but only humanity. The eth this ethnographic density within a humanist modernity was in a way part of the politics of the Southeast Asian artist curator who wanted to break through the autonomies and antinomies of art and the modern to come in contact with the raw nerves of the struggle with daily life across uh, cultural jurisdictions. And in the disposition of Okwi's adjacency, tangential to German expressionism or perhaps off-centric to it was the in-between or threshold personage of uh, Walter Spies, who was also the subject of my research in Germany. Spies was a German artist born in Russia, who after spending time in the Ural Mountains with the Bashkir community, went to Bali in the late 1920s, where he would paint and take photographs, work with local artists to form the Pitamaha community, uh, re-choreographs uh, a trans ritual, and be in conversation with Margaret Mead, Gregory Bateson, Miguel Covarrubias, and Charlie Chaplin, whom he hosted in the island. He was, um, he was the lover of the filmmaker F.W. Murnau, who was, and was involved in the filming of Nosferatu, which found a prominent place in the expressionist repertoire. To respond to the inclinations of this panel, I foreground the ethnographic unconscious of the Biennale through the mediations of worldliness. The latter would be transcoded by the ubiquitous quotidian of the contemporary and the thick description of ancestral cosmology, both of which had been embodied by the artist curator collective in Southeast Asia in the 70s and in Germany and Bali in the interwar years, and both of which summoned the memory of a primitive accumulation and the uh, aesthetics of diversity. The artist curator collective in the practices and agencies of Jim Sopankat, Red Sapiedasa, Raimundo Almano, 
a Pinan Posonanda, the artist of the Die Brücke, and the Der Blau writer and Walter Spies risked their subjectivities through the critique of modernity as they sought to exceed its limits simultaneously. <clears throat> These modernities may have adumbrated post-colonial and decolonial politics and persist to raise the specters of racialization as we speak. In many ways, the recent Truang Rupa episode in Documenta in, at Kassel in 2022 is a trace of this trajectory, Ruang Rupa being themselves an artist-curator collective enmeshed in the capitalisms and the cooperatives of the Binali enterprise and Lumbung the vernacular architecture of sharing being another moment of the ethnographic epistemology, coated within the grammar of either an actually existing or an idealized mutuality and solidarity. Surely, Ruang Rupa forms part of the arc of an earlier emergency and the prospect of the contemporary counter-conjuncture, albeit seemingly without the investment in the rewriting of modernity and the decisive reflection on and refunctioning of the curatorial. I can, con I can only conclude tentatively the modernities of ethnos and racialization continue to loom large and initiations that pursue decentralization without deconstruction. A democratic horizontality without post-structuralism will encounter tough resistance, if not altogether miss opportunities. I think only a punctual but patient intricate and I dare say queer conception of the artistic, curatorial and collective practice may be able to dissipate the resilient strata of this oftentimes unforgiving modernity. I leave with two points for future elaboration. In the Der Blau writer Imaginarium, the teleological fantasy was abstraction. Baya Kandinsky, who wrote the internationally salient on the spiritual in art in 1912, and it may well be fast forward to the 70s through the present that the curatorial of our time enacts the intractability of representation within an intimate worldliness or to meddle with Oquist physiology and intense and homeliness. Finally, if we constellate Oqui and resource citation of the poetics of ethnography and acute contiguity with the call of Clementine de Lis to uh, quote, suspend the logos of the ethnos, then perhaps we can fish out from the ecology of the artist curator collective the potentiality of the interlocus, which lies at the heart of the intersubjective work of the artist curator collective convergence. And to converge, according to the eminent historian of subalternity, Ranajit Guha, is, and I quote him, to tend to meet in a point as lines do in a figure, or to approximate like numbers do in a mathematical series towards a given limit. It is for one thing to incline towards another in a specified direction and approach it closely enough uh, to verge on it. Thank you. That's not me, sorry. Um, while the PowerPoint's uh, getting put on, um, just want to say thank you all so much for coming along and especially to Hoa, to Salah, to Maria and the rest of the foundation team. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be speaking at a March meeting. I want to bounce off what Terry was talking about this morning and what Patrick's just been speaking about. And I want to argue against the complaint uh, that biennials are merely a bastion of neoliberal capitalism and that their emergence insights far beyond Paris, uh, Venice, New York, are but a belated mimicry of exhibition models devised in the centers of old. This position, so often voiced by critics in the North Atlantic region, is I think quite wrong. As Charles Green and I have been at pains to point out for some time now, what we call the second wave of biennials uh, generated all over the world, and especially the decolonizing world from the 1950s onwards, offers a much more complex narrative 
than the North Atlantic caricature of exhibition histories allows. As biennials and triennials started to emerge in cities as dispersed as Alexandria and Saigon, you can see the catalogues for those editions here, in Ljubljana and Delhi, Medellin and Jogjakarta, these exhibitions and their organizers not only sought to disperse the presumptions that one's gaze should always be trained on North Atlantic strongholds desperately wanting to cling to global power, they also brought in radical innovations, expanding their constituency to engage with many different artists from all over the world, often in pan-regional and south-south exchange. They showcased media often deemed marginal to so-called advanced practice, such as prints and posters, the graphics biennial from Ljubljana with prints on the left, Warsaw poster biennial on the right. And that was because of the relative ease of their production and their transportability, opening up the prospects of who could be recognized as an artist, especially in terms of gender, class, and race and how to get art posted across national borders without, as often happened uh, with larger, bulkier artworks like paintings or sculptures, uh, without being refused by the border guards and censors. They often created new infrastructural possibilities as well. And you can see some images of these from Medellin, such as uh, education programs for local residents and especially student populations and new public collections drawn from acquisitions made during the biennial, uh, such as the Coltehair Art Collection in Medellin, named after the Coltehair Biennial there from 1968 to 72. As cities and countries sought to rebuild in the wake of imperialism, colonization, and conflict, art and culture could provide new platforms of stability and exchange, and assertions of one's presence in a complex new internationalism. Now, I'm fascinated by these rich and complicated histories, but I don't want to pursue the other extreme from our North Atlantic critics and be nostalgic for a past solidarity that never really was. These exhibitions were really muddy affairs filled with paradox. And this may be true of all such large-scale group exhibitions, which can sometimes beat the drum of internationalism too heavily, too intently. So let me touch on five of these paradoxes, and I'm very glad that Patrick raised the term paradoxical and paradox before. It's a nice flow through. So five of these paradoxes before considering an exhibition that sought to respond innovatively to at least some of them. So paradox one. While we might laud the creation of these new exhibition strategies and institutions outside the North Atlantic and their attempts to decentralize or splinter North Atlantic hegemony, we should also remember that they were, more often than not, celebrations of the exhibition sponsors. This could be private philanthropists fascinated by seeing in themselves the mirror image of Documenta or Venice. And examples of this would be the founders of the Sao Paulo and Sydney biennials, uh, Francisco Matarazzo Sobrino and Franco Belgiorno Netis, respectively. Or it could be the state itself. And it should not surprise us to see that some of these biennials were closely aligned with the internationalist ambitions of the state's leaders, uh, the big men, as Chica Okeke would rightly describe them, of Cold War non-aligned politics, which flows on as well from the first session this morning. So from Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, to whom the Alexandria Biennial was dedicated, and you see him on the left, to Yugoslav President Josip Broz Tito, supporter of the Ljubljana Biennial there on the right in the Biennial itself. We can continue with this theme right through to today, including the biennials in Shanghai that becomes liberalized for a global market at the same time as the Chinese economy does after Deng's reforms, or Singapore, uh, inaugurated alongside the 2006 joint meeting of the World Bank and IMF on the island city-state. And here are some images from that biennial, including, you can sort of see on the, maybe in the image on the left-hand side, uh, Yayo Kusama's work on Orchard Road with these banners celebrating the uh, joint meeting of the World Bank and IMF. The paradox is, however, that while these exhibitions might seem to be the narcissistic products of their founders' imaginations, they've also allowed for new kinds of experimentation, both in art practice and public debate. We can think of the public meetings in Medellin, uh, sites for rare debates in 1970 and 72 about encroaching interventions by the United States throughout Latin America, or the inclusion of posters in Warsaw's biennial in 1966, as you see here, celebrating both consumerist advertising from the United States 
and North Vietnamese wartime posters. Um, the poster declares here, defend our native land, defend our youth. My apologies to Pamela if that's an incorrect translation. Or the slow permissiveness towards imagery about sex, sexuality, or unequal labor relations in Singapore, Shanghai, or here in Sharjah. Despite state strictures, the exhibition can open, however briefly, a small fissure in its social structures. Paradox two. Biennials initially seem to increase the tempo and hasten the obsolescence inherent to contemporary life. Their recurrence every two years and the burgeoning numbers of biennials taking place around the world, especially since the mid-1950s, means that now, according to the stats, there's a biennial opening on average once a week, sometimes uh, somewhere across the globe, shattering both the long durée on which art history is often founded and the presumption that one can ever really develop a sense of mastery over the global scale of artistic production and display. But that's just one aspect of a biennial's temporality. With two years between installments and curators often pre-planning elements of a biennial years in advance, Biennials can also be exhibitions that permit a really slow rareness that is rare, especially amid the gallery churn, a slowness that allows for exploring ideas and building resources, as we see in this Sharjah Biennial, with the resources rare for any exhibition today, and for developing a deep-seated trust between a curator and an artist or group, to the point that the history of one uh, may be inseparable from the history of the other. Think of Yves Klein and Pierre Rustany, Catherine de Zega and Simran Gill, Okwien Weza and Boris Isaac Kingles, or Yinka Shonabare, or Olo Aguibe, or Thomas Hirschhorn, the list goes on. Paradox three. The reason for an exhibition's inauguration can quickly become its limitation and basis for stagnation. Ljubljana's graphics biennial is now hampered by formal restrictions on what constitutes the graphic. The many uh, biennials celebrating third worldist politics from Delhi's Triennale of Contemporary World Art, and you see the inauguration of the 1974 edition there on the left, to Dhaka's Asian Art Biennale, to Havana's Biennale, all have struggled to respond to shifting political winds and either collapsed or lost their relevance, or been superseded by newer exhibition models, uh, Delhi to Kochi with its own achievements and struggles, Havana to the double zero biennial and various boycotts against the censorship of artists, the Asian art biennale to the much glitzier darker art summit. Guangzhou, as Patrick just noted uh, before as well, was launched in 1995 to celebrate the 1980 uprisings that enabled social and political change in South Korea, but returns to that commemoration so often in its iterations and press releases that it threatens to become a straitjacket for the future. Paradox four, biennials may seek to champion or draw attention to a marginalized or struggling locale, but they can also drain resources from that site of struggle. The emergency Biennale in Chechnya, for instance, was designed with the best of intentions to shine a cultural spotlight on Chechnya under Russian, uh, Russian fire in the early 2000s, and to bring work by major international artists to the streets and apartments of Grozny, uh, Chechnya's capital. But much of that work was on portable discs, CDs, DVDs, uh, requiring computers, screens, and electricity, all of which made vast presumptions about the infrastructures available in a war zone, and demands on finding those resources, lest the work be present, but unshowable, present, but unpresentable. Paradox five, local boosterism or that compulsion to attend the specific virtues and challenges of a locale may be the impulse behind the creation of many a biennial. But it's often the local context of an artwork's production that gets lost, uh, decontextualized in a group exhibition, perhaps in any exhibition. Whether shifted to a reclaimed space or a white cube, the artwork invariably sheds the context of its making, the imperatives behind it, the discussions around it. In this installation view, for instance, which is the emerging indigenous Australian artist's work and which the American stalwarts? And does that difference really matter? Or rather, how does that difference matter? 
Local distinction, in other words, may be what underpins a biennial's founding, but it's also what a biennial often makes an artwork shed first as the price of entry to its aesthetic of global equivalence. So those are five of the no doubt myriad paradoxes we can draw from the histories and the currencies of biennials since their second wave started in the 1950s and especially through the 1970s. But I'm not convinced that all international group exhibitions are doomed to assert parochial visions or to art wash political sin. Can an exhibition still combat modes of decontextualization and cultural amnesia whilst supporting the unexpected discussion and different ways of inhabiting the past so as to reimagine the future. Here I want to touch on a curatorial episode from the fourth iteration of the Guangzhou Biennale, so not too long before Patrick's uh, in, in 2008. It's the exhibition launched to commemorate the Korean uprising and massacre of May 1980, as I said, um, but this iteration took an importantly distinct focus. This episode was called Pause, uh, curated by Ho Hanru, Charles Escher, and Wan Kyung Sung as part one of the 2002 Guangzhou Biennale. So perhaps deliberately, provocatively putting out there another 2002 to go alongside, be adjacent to uh, Documenta 11. Now strikingly for an international group exhibition, the curators did not select specific artists to present individual works. They instead invited 23 artist-run and independent spaces from across Asia, including Videotage, Parasite, and Capital, uh, Cattle Depot Art Village from Hong Kong, Rungrupa from Jakarta, Chamati Art House from Jakarta, and Washong Art District and IT Park from Taipei, as well as a handful from elsewhere in the world, uh, such as Kuriman Zotov from Mexico City and the Foxhall Gallery Foundation from Warsaw. And the curators invited these initiatives to present themselves, their activities, and the kind of work they support in their home cities. As is typical for many Leviathan group exhibitions, uh, each ensemble received an allocated footprint in Guangzhou's cavernous Biennale Hall. Unlike most biennials, though, the contributors could use the space and present their work however they wished, with many electing to replicate in miniature the layout of their original spaces, such that these uh, quasi-pavilions dotted the Biennale Hall, uh, as in, according to Ho Han Ru, an event city, um, which is kind of an interesting apt description, I think, for the allotments then became meeting grounds for each institution to present public programs of talks or screenings, as they usually would, and to showcase their signature practices, uh, whether conceptual or video work, or feasts of discussion and food, as you see here, in concentrated, intimate proximity to the other spaces. What often emerged through the Biennale's run was an interweaving of spaces and programs, with people joining from the other ensembles, such that divisions between proximity to each other and participation with each other very quickly dissolved. Dinners cooked by hosts from one ensemble became shared experiences for all. Formal discussions about art and cultural histories in Jogjakarta or Beijing or Singapore segued to informal dialogues over hot pots and the start of new collaborations between these small-scale organizations, all smuggled under the auspices of the sprawling Biennale. The exhibition thus became less a series of artworks, as is familiar from other international group shows, than a network of platforms that looked out to and worked with each other, and sometimes quite literally so, with balconies stretching out towards nearby pavilions and floor plans starting to overlap as activities between the organizations increased. Through this network, the ensembles were able to share their philosophies and praxis learning about and indeed working together to practice each other's conditions and methods of cultural production through their array of auto-curated discussions, exhibitions, and programs. I can't help but thinking about that comment uh, at the end of the first session about an aesthetics of hope. I sort of wonder if this might be part of that too. This delegated or auto-curation is crucial here because it did two key things. Firstly, it provided a sense of local context that was both formal and substantive. Formal in that each initiative replicated the form and layout of their home space, running the kinds of programs and exhibitions that would inhabit that space ordinarily. 
and substantive in that they use those programs to analyze and present how work is made and shown in those home conditions as testimony to the challenges and outlooks offered by those conditions. And secondly, uh, this auto curation emphasized each organization's autonomy to develop and constantly redevelop their communications with each other throughout the Biennale's duration. This was often done regardless and in deliberate ignorance of the pause curator's initial plans. It's this uncontrolled, ever-changing program, uncontrolled that is by top-down curatorial authority, which together with the substantive exposition of the forces shaping locality, arguably distinguishes pause from some of the problematic tropes associated with biennial since the 50s. The persistent trope of the traumatic past to which Guangzhou, amongst other exhibitions, has often reduced itself, or the reductive simulacra of faraway locations and performance of supposed quote-unquote tradition, which has characterized other attempts to contextualize the local, evident in exhibitions as dispersed as the universal expositions of the 19th century with their living dioramas, right up to Magician de la Terre from 1989. In so doing, pause also offered a different exhibiting format from what biennials usually offer with their anchoring in art fairs or the national pavilions of the Venice Biennale. This revised structure was more akin to the conglomeration of artist-run initiatives that have been the very backbone of contemporary arts histories in East and Southeast Asia. The independent and quasi-independent artist villages such as Washang in Taipei and Cattle Capital, uh, Depot in Hong Kong but also the artist village in Singapore or Beijing East Village from the 1980s into the 1990s, each of which has offered space relatively free, however briefly or precariously, from state control in which the region's artists could make, show, and sell their experimental work. The model of artist villages could, in other words, provide a very different format for a biennial from the norms originating in the North Atlantic since the 19th century. It's an alternative reference point derived specifically from East Asian cultural histories and shared with participants and visitors regardless of their own place of origin. I want to conclude uh, by suggesting that pause epitomizes the kind of global entanglements richly described by Taiwanese cultural scholar Chen Quangqing and which complicate the North Atlantic's self-affirming narratives of centers and peripheries. For Chen, the kinds of exchanges evident in Guangzhou are not just about speaking. It's not just words easily made, words easily forgotten, but about sharing the actual material conditions under which subjecthood emerges. This material exchange is the foundation for what Chen calls internationalist localism, for looking out from one's own localism to that of others, such that, and I quote him here, uh, new political possibilities emerge out of the practices and experiences accumulated during encounters between local and international specificities and histories. It's a call that resonates, perhaps extends, with uh, Okwi and Wes's thinking on post-colonial constellations and shares in that sensibility the need for intersectional understandings of history. Understandings that can deconstruct North Atlantic norms, including those offered by biennials, whilst generating other knowledges grounded in and drawn from specific local contexts. Translocal approaches to history and culture, if you will, that are both internationalist and localized at once, emphasizing sharing and difference as the basis for proper knowledge building. And which, as Angela Davis puts it so brilliantly in Mantia Diawara's film here in Sharjah, which I really urge you all to see if you can, what they show is how we inhabit the world and how we might imagine it otherwise. Thank you. I want to begin by thanking Salah Hassan, Iftika Dadi, and everyone else who's worked so hard to gather us here today. Um, with this talk, we move 
a little away from biennales and exhibitions. Um, we, are ga we are assembled today at a time when relentless processes of globalization cohabit with equally global calls to tighten borders and render national cultures distinct, mitigate freedom of speech and action with circumspect censorship, and reinscribe otherness onto bodies that are unlike and therefore deemed expendable. Standing in this embattled present, artists, scholars, and curators have increasingly turned to the historical moment of decolonization with urgency, especially after the year 2005, which marked the 50th anniversary of an Im incredibly important conjunction in this history. That, and, and this conjunction is, of course, the 1955 Afro-Asian Conference at Bandung, Indonesia, where leaders of the newly decolonized countries of Asia and Africa gathered to inaugurate the Third World Project and lay the groundwork for the subsequent formalization of the 1961 Non-Aligned Movement at Belgrade. This intellectual background serves as the context for my own research, and it is on this ground that I also wish to stage the long 1970s, a decade in which newly decolonized nation states rapidly spiraled into crisis. My talk proceeds with the assumption that we need an imaginative history of the third world to better understand the intense and inexorable hold that it has exerted on intellectual thought despite the widely acknowledged failure of the post-colonial dreams that had galvanized the nation states that came into being in the post-war era. Therefore, to the growing vectors of the transnational gatherings prompted by the moment of Bandung, I wish to add the history of the predominantly West Coast Third World Liberation Front, or TWLF, formed by Asian American, African American, Native American, and Latin American students in 1968-69. While the TWLF has most often been regarded as part of a regional history, the coalition, after all, was active solely in the United States, and that too, only at the San Francisco State University and the University of California. Still, the invocation of the third in the Third World Liberation Front, nonetheless univocally linked the TWLF to the Bandung Conference and the imagination of the Third World that it spawned. I want to propose that tracing the intellectual cartography of the TWLF allows us to intercept the Third World at dispersed sites of invocation, sites that are far beyond its conventional geographic reach, but nonetheless reveals the imaginative ambits of Bandung in the long 1970s. I wish, in other words, to mobilize the third world as a method for thinking through and writing new histories of the long 1970s and beyond, not only of the global south, but of the world. This is why I neither begin nor end in the third world, or what is now known as the global south, but in my own backyard, as it were, at the University of California, Berkeley, where I work and where the story that I want to recount today continues to take on a multitude of afterlives at various conjunctures of conflict and restitution. I should add that I will not address the proliferation of mega exhibitions and biennales in the period under consideration in this panel as my aim in a speculative mode is to see if we can reanimate once again, this time by way of a youth movement in a place outside of the global south, the unrealized aspirations of decolonization. In doing so, I wish to explore what it means to think historically in any given present, with and against a state of emergency or a state of exception in Carl Spitt and George Yorgamben's sense. In this instance, precipitated by Ronald Reagan, who was then the Calif governor of California, and whose illustrious list of political achievements as the 40th president of the United States include economic deregulation and the ascent of neoliberalism, anti-union anti policies, and escalation in the arms race with the Soviet Union, the invasion of Granada in 1983, 
1986 bombing of Libya, the secret sale of arms to Iran, and support for insurgency against the social gov socialist government of Nicaragua. We begin then with a strike. On November 6, 1968, one of the longest and perhaps the most intense of student protests in the United States was initiated at the San Francisco State University when students of color organized under the banner of the Third World Liberation Front, or TWLF, a moniker that in itself refracted the global imaginative impact that the Bandung Conference had on communities of color in the 1960s and the 1970s across the world. For four long months until March 20, 1969, students, faculty, staff, and other members of the San Francisco State University waged a protracted battle that eventually led to the establishment of a College of Ethnic Studies. From the San Francisco State University, the movement spread to UC Berkeley, where the TWLF strike began on January 22, 1969. A chronology of events published by the Berkeley chapter of the TWLF indicates that the ferment was already set in mid-1968 when, when the African American Student Union presented the university administration with a proposal for the establishment of a black studies department and, Me and Mexican students demanded the university stop purchasing table grapes in solidarity with the Delano grape strike of the Filipino and Mexican farm workers in California. Subsequently, when the TWLF was formed in Berkeley in early 1969, it was joined by Asian American, African American, Native American, and Mexican student organizations. Such a coalition of darker and indigenous peoples was quite unprecedented in the, in the United States. And the galvanizing force of the TWLF, as they formed picket lines at every major entrance of the university campus at Berkeley, is clearly indexed in the few photographs of the movement that do exist today. At face value, the demands of the TWLF were deceptively simple. First, the TWLF sought to establish a third world college with an emphasis on African American, Native American, Chicano, and Asian studies. Second, this, they sought greater representation of people of color at all levels and in all units across the university. Third, an increase in admission of minority students and greater control over the production of knowledge about third world cultures. And lastly, protection from disciplinary action. As such, these initial demands do not present us with extraordinary imaginaries of alternative futures, and nor do they challenge the global political ferment in any constitutive way. But what is extraordinary is the claim to a less hierarchical and more pluralistic rearrangement of pedagogy in the name of the third world by a coalition of youth almost entirely consisting of American-born students of color whose affiliations with the politics, cultures, and experiences of decolonization in Asia and Africa were tenuous at best. It then becomes necessary to ask what the third world may have meant for the TWLF in the long 1970s. By now, it is widely accepted that the third world was not simply a category of development, as economic histories would have it. Rather, it was a project of self-definition on part of the formerly colonized that was subsequently leveraged at the Afro-Asian Conference at Bandung in 1955. Contra the conventional North Atlantic perception of the third world as an unending geography of underdevelopment, the Bandung cont contingent perceived it as a terrain of possibility for a different global politics. And from the 1950s onwards, thinkers such as Fanon and Césaire, among others, had already begun to describe Bandung as foundational for a third world intellectual consciousness. If Bandung heralded the entrance of third world nations onto the world stage, it also spurred the transformation of leftists of color in the United States. In the United States, the African-American anthropologist and activist W.E.B. Du Bois had repeatedly linked the African-American struggle to that of the colonized people's struggle against imperialism, forcibly emphasizing the intersections of color, caste, and class in a tract on the Beng Bengali Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore that he wrote for the journal Crisis as early as 1929. 
the subsequent amplification of these ideas by diverse left, leftist coalitions in the United States, including the TWLF and the Black Panthers, in whom the TWLF would find a consummate alliance, as indicated by the flyer for a memorial meeting for Malcolm X, transgress several boundaries, most particularly those of race, nation, and identity formations. Indeed, in the Bay Area, African-American activists such as Angela Davis had systematically analyzed the ways in which incarceration, housing segregation, and welfare discrimination mimicked the colonial practices of containment in the former colonies of the Third World and served as a blueprint for US imperial designs. And as children of immigrants, the Asian American contingent of the TWLF were all too familiar with the practices of racial and anthropological profiling invented and perfected in the British colonies and transported to American shores to categorize, contain, manage, and surveil the Asian populace of the United States. It is perhaps for this very reason that the most articulate conjunction of their own struggle with that of the third world appears in the pamphlets of the Asian American Political Alliance of the TWLF, not coincidentally, it is categorically linked to the Afro-Asian Conference at Bandung. At Berkeley, the analogy of colonialism and state oppression was of course intensified and concretized when at California, Gov California Governor Ronald Reagan's prompting, the California Highway Patrol responded to the TWLF strikes with tear gas and batons simulating a situation analogous to that of an ongoing civil war in May 1969. Reagan then commanded the state National Guard troops to occupy the city of Berkeley for 17 days to subdue the protesters. However, in February 1970, violent protests broke out near the University of California, Santa Barbara, where Reagan once again commanded the National Guard. If it takes a bloodbath, Let's get it over with, he infamously stated. Almost immediately, the destruction wrecked upon unarmed civilian targets by the air attack on the unmilitarized, undefended small town of Guernica during the Spanish Civil War in 1937, and so powerfully visualized in Picasso's Guernica, became a symbol of dehumanization internal to modern warfare yet again. This does not suggest that the TWLF perceived their own struggle as comparable to that of, a, uh, that of the small hamlet in Spain. Rather, the TWLF's invocation of Guernica, a painting that had been repeatedly cited by artists of leftist persuasions across the Third World as a synodoche for civil strife and class struggle, is telling in its attempt to constellate a new and innovative iconography that pivots on imagined transnational affinities and affiliations based on dispersed and disparate experiences of oppression. This ideologically inclines the TWLF towards a much wider network of labor solidarities of which power to the people serves as a catchphrase. In practice, it allies the TWLF to labor unions in California. At the same time, it generates a vocabulary of politics from below from the dynamics of colonial and imperial oppression worldwide. The refusal to territorialize the politics of the TWLF within a regional context then serves to generate a consciousness of entangled past and presents that in turn produce an imaginary revolutionary future as the TWLF proceeds to make the unequivocal demand that racism must be eradicated, not just in the university, but in the world at large. Such an expansive aspiration for collective sovereignty perhaps requires unique iconographic subterfuges. Consequently, images and iconographies drawn from analogous struggles come to be anchored and reinstalled, in this instance, an emblematic figure to the far right, a sketch from the publications of the Black Panthers among photographs from Vietnam, stands in for the sovereignty of Vietnam to come even as this future of self-determination hovers outside of immediate horizons, the future of sovereignty is nonetheless assured in the realm of the TWLF's imagination. Vietnam will win. With this, 
revolutionary polemic enters the realm of revolutionary possibilities. I hope to have amply demonstrated three points in the course of my talk today. The first is the truly compelling nature of the TWLF within the context of the long 1970s. The second is the relationship between revolutionary iconography and revolutionary imagination, sometimes articulated far uh, from the locus of geographic origins. I hope to have also shown that these categories are not discrete, but that they morph into one. The implications of this aggregation can no doubt be worked out in disparate sites of enunciation. My third point is that geopolitical markers such as Bandung and the Third World need to be approached in relation to the means of imagination. It is not enough to use decolonization as a tool of analysis in relation to political economy or in relation to the geocultures of new nation states. We need an imaginative history of decolonization in the long 1970s in order to better understand the intense and inexorable hold that it has continued to exert on intellectual thought despite the widely acknowledged paucity and frailty of the political reality of the non-aligned countries. In other words, I propose we intercept the third world once again, across time, at the sites of its invocation, in the tracks of feelings and imagination of dispersed groups across the world. Here, we may find a method for writing new histories, writing new art histories, put differently, in cultural critic and curator Geeta Kapoor's words, when telescoped in history, the third world becomes the symbolic option, and then the polemic enters the realm of possibilities. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank all the uh, organizing committee for the kind invitation. <clears throat> so in 2003, Aramayani was one of several Indonesian artists invited to display their works in the Indonesian pavilion at the 50th edition of the Venice Biennale, along with Dadang Cristanto, Disna Sanjaya, and Madhu Yanta. Aramayani presented a room installation titled 11 June 2002, a recreation of the small hotel room where the immigration authority detained her at the Los Angeles airport on her way to Canada for not having a stopover visa. After hours of negotiations, Aramaini was allowed to stay in the hotel room uh, that she had booked uh, with the stipulation that a male security officer had to be in the room to keep her watch, leaving her feeling dis disturbed. The installation at the Venice Biennale was a recreation of the initial version of the work Armayani exhibited at the Alexander Ox Gallery in Berlin. Her installation in Berlin was contained within a small square room uh, with a white paint window and exposed pipes on one side of the wall. Instead of the bleak beige colors of the room as seen in the photograph uh, Armayani took of the hotel room she had to stay in, the room is reimagined in bright red and white color scheme with red heart pattern bed, sheet, and curtain. A Quran is uh, propped on the center of the pillow with a red blanket covering the end part of a single wooden bed. Pieces of clothing were thrown uh, on the bed, chair, and red carpeted floor. And where the red carpet ends, two large vintage Coca-Cola vending machines that were labeled and wired for use in Germany in the 1950s stand on a dark red floor radiating a sense of post-war and post-apocalyptic precarity, contingency, and cruel optimism of the social democratic promise of the post-war period in the US and Europe. For Arahmayani, however, the Coke vending machine and other Coca-Cola pr products have always stood as a criticism of and resistance against the effects of curse of glo globalization, capitalism, and neoliberal and neocolonial modes of asserting global hegemony and power. The recreation of the work still um, at, at Venice and uh, at Machan, the Museum Machan in Jakarta, Museum of Contemporary Art, for her 2018 solo exhibition, still captures the physical memory and emotional trauma 
uh, and a creative reimagination of Aramayana's horrid and humiliating experience of detention and racial and religious stereotyping. In the installation, Aramayani also included photographs of her in several states of undress, further illustrating the invasion of privacy and her modesty as a Muslim woman. On the other hand, the heart patterned sheet and curtain in this installation seem to manifest the artist's precarious hope to bring love still and redress the increasingly negative image of Islam, particularly after the devastating 9-11 attacks in New York and uh, Washington and the Bali bombing in 2002. Curated by Amir Siddhartha, entitled Paradise Lost, Morning of the World, the presentation at the Indonesian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale was a response to these events and the complicated positions of Muslims like Arahmayani, who have to fight intolerance and violence perpetrated both by the West and by fundamentalist Muslims across different parts of the Islamic world, including Indonesia, fights that continues until today. Scholars have positioned Arahmayani as one of the uh, prominent contemporary artists who emerged through biennial platforms in Asia in the 1990s, whose powerful body of works was molded by trauma and violence of authoritarian regimes, uh, human rights abuses, and political instability. This presentation follows the start of Arahmayani's practice uh, during the height of the New Order regime in Indonesia, and stories of her participation in pivotal forums that contributed to the centering of Asia and the rethinking of the prevalent uh, Euro-American cultural hegemonies. This image from Arahmayani's performance at the Asia Pacific Triennial, Triennial in Brisbane, Australia is perhaps the most iconic one of her works. While APT is one of the most well-known platforms that introduced and catapulted Southeast Asian contemporary art and artists to global renown, I would also like to note several other exhibitions Arahmayani participated that proposed alternative access that advances local and regional perspectives, namely the Biennales Nerupa Jakarta in 1993, the Festival Istiklal, and the Contemporary Art of the Non-Aligned Countries exhibition in Jakarta, uh, both in 1995. These exhibitions brought new expressions and modes of artistic practice to the fore and forged dialogues and alliances with other global knowledge systems that decentralized the West and privileged what Jim Sapankat, uh, a curator and artist that uh, Patrick uh, talked about, reiterated in 1995 as the South-South Axis. Arahmayani is part of the generation of Indonesian artists who, was, who were part of what Jim Sapanka terms as, quote unquote, the 80s generation. Those who experimented with performance, happening, and installation motivated by the need to find modes of expression that could directly and effectively address the enduring violence that accompanied the modernization project of the authoritarian New Order regime. It was 1979 when Arahmayani enrolled as a student at a modernist art training institution in Bandung to study painting. It was four years after Gerakan Senirupa Baru Indonesia, or the Indonesian New Art Movement, published their manifesto rebelling against the status quo of Indonesian modern art and the aesthetic hegemony of modernist abstraction of established artists. It was five years after the first students' movement that criticized the New Order's government's open investment policies from Japan and the United States, concretized as a massive and continuous political protest after its initial brewing in the early 1970s. A year before Arahmayani enrolled, the New Order regime under President Suharto imposed a quote-unquote normalization of campus life as a measure to control students' activism on campus under the military. Many students' activists at major universities in Indonesia consequently organized themselves, often moving on underground to form organizations without names or forms uh, that fell under the broad category of organisasi tanpa bentuk, or organizations without form a term used by the regime to label any opposition movement as communist, regardless of their ideological basis. As chronicled by Amanda Rath, Arahmayani's experience with activism started with her involvement in students' demonstrations in 1979 against the presence of the military on, camp on campus and other activities through the organizations without form. Arahmayani's experimental and performance works she made during her study, uh, like these two, challenged the pedagogical methods and the aesthetics regimes of the art training in Bandung, known for its modernist tradition. Her collaborative performances from the 1980s, such as Accident and Newspaper Men, embody out of Mayanis dissatisfaction and staunch criticism of the government and the military. 
The Iranian Revolution of 1979 also contributed to the dramatic changes in the landscapes of intellectual and political activism in Indonesia, and its reverberation indirectly affected the reception of Aramayani's most known works, Lingayoni and Atalasa, shown in her solo exhibition in Jakarta in 1994. The strengthening of Islamist politics fueled uh, the already growing Islamic movements initiated through Dakwa or proselytization program since the late 1960s. The New Order's tightening of student activism ironically also spurred this growing interest in Islamic activism among students that gradually and unassumingly became more fundamentalist and reactionary uh, throughout the period of the regime. Scholars of political Islam in Indonesia also note the increase in students' religious piety accompanied by the rise of Islamic publishing houses and the circulation of, of, of books on the Islamic movements in Iran. Nur Haidi Hassan, for example, pointedly argues that the situation in the 1970s and 80s provided the, pre the precondition for the spread of ideologies from transnational Islamic movements on campus grounds. Martin van Brunsen uh, observes that the quote-unquote Islamic turn in President Suharto's policies around the 1990s uh, when he allied himself with the new Muslim middle class, also had empowered many moderate and reactionary Islamists that were previously sidelined. Within this context of an underlying shift in Indonesian Islam, Arahmayani's 1994 solo exhibition in Jakarta titled Sex, Coca-Cola, and Religion uh, received an unprecedented reactionary response from a group of Muslim audiences that baffled Arahmayani and her circles of artists and activists. For many Indonesians outside of the mosque circle, the growth of more fundamentalist uh, Islamic activism went under the radar. It was only evident when it partook in uh, the political contestation of power after the fall of the New Order regime in 1998. To escape the death threat thrown at her by the fundamentalist group, Rahmayani decided to take refuge in Australia before she returned briefly in 1995 uh, and then after that, he began her nomadic life, which informed her practice until today. Aramayani has largely forgotten her minor participation in one of the collaborative installation and performance works presented at the 1995 Festival Istiqlal in Jakarta. Perhaps the small picture of her uh, at the top right corner of the exhibition catalog page uh, of the performance and installation that engaged with, its, with environmental issues titled uh, An Ox, uh, is, is the only futile reminder of her visit. The 1995 Festival Istiqlal and its first iteration in 1991 were intended as an international platform to show the breadth of quote-unquote contemporary Islamic art and position Indonesia as the new center of Islamic art, culture, and civilization. This vision was first announced by President Sukarno in the organization of the Asia-Africa Islamic Conference in Bandung in 1965. Organized by Indonesian artist and curator A.D. Pirus, known for his contribution to developing modern Islamic art in Indonesia, the Indonesian government generously sponsored Festival Istiqlal as part of the tourism program. On a political level, the festival served the government's agenda of cultivating and propagating the image of Indonesian Islam that is both cultural and therefore not political and tolerant in the national and international spheres. Within domestic politics, the festivals were also part of the New Order's strategy to garner Muslim votes and political support before the 1997 national election. While the authoritarian regime utilized the 1995 Festival Istiqlal to embellish its image for the tourism industry and political gains, I would like to note its significance. The festival connected the divergent experience experiences and expressions of Muslim artists across the globe and their experimentation with Islamic forms, ideas, and histories. More interestingly, the exhibition confidently juxtaposed contemporary art and Islamic art without much contradiction. Bypassing its fields often fraught and arbitrary historical categorizations, hierarchization, and politics of aesthetics. It was one of the most significant exhibitionary events in Southeast Asia that focused on Islamic art from the perspective of Southeast Asia while responding to the shift of art-making practices and discourses in Indonesia and Asia. It, it was granted that the term quote-unquote senirupa contemporary or contemporary art in the Indonesian context possesses a somewhat ambiguous sense that does not necessarily signify a critical departure from the modernist paradigm. The discursive ground for uh, contemporary art in the context of Indonesia was constantly negotiated 
as artists, curators, and intellectuals continuously redefined its premises as exemplified in the controversy surrounding Biennale's Nirupa Jakarta or Jakarta Biennial, in which Arahmayani also participated with her performance and installation titled Four Faces. In a recent conversation, Arahmayani recalled that Four Faces manifested her quest and desire to look at the continuity of the pre-Islamic belief system and cultural forms that she felt had been severed by colonial looting of artifacts and the new order modernization impulse. Her painting, Lingayoni, that we saw before, one of the sources of controversy in 1994, also carries the same concern. Serving as a survey of recent trends in Indonesian art, Jim Supangkat, as the curator of Jakarta Biennial uh, in 1993, prematurely defined uh, contemporary art within a vague understanding of postmodernism. Agung Hujatnika, an uh, Indonesian scholar, notes that many critics rejected Supangkat's assertion. Even the artist in the exhibition, Samsar Siahaan, outrightly renounced it at the entrance to his work, uh, Panggali and Kambali, or the excavation, with a banner that read, quote, you are entering a zone free of postmodern gravity, unquote. This reaction perhaps represents what T.K. Sabapati observed as the, quote, wariness towards accepting or succumbing to orthodoxies emerging, imposed, or acquired from the West, unquote, that had been emphatically expressed in the region. Two years after Jakarta Biennial in 1993, and in the same year following Festival Estiklal, Arahmayani exhibited a reiteration of one of her most well-known conceptual installations, Sacred Coke, that she exhibited along with Lingayoni and Etalasa uh, in her solo show in 94. The Holy Cola, as it was titled in the catalog, was one of the significant numbers of works exhibited at the Contemporary Art of the Non-Aligned Countries exhibition in 1995. The Coke bottle capped with a condom and set on top of a circular arrangement of soil and rice foregrounds Arahmayani's caution about the entanglement of cultural imperialism with the global capitalist order as homogenizing forces and its, and its extractive mode that result in environmental degradation and ecological disasters. Jim Supankat was asked to organize this large contemporary art exhibition and seminar with an international team of curators, including A.D. Perus, the curator for Festival Istiklal, T.K. Sabapati from Singapore, Apinan Poshananda from Thailand, Pidat Casas de Balesteros from Colombia, Emmanuel Arinze uh, from Nigeria, and Gulam Mohammed Sheikh from India. Edi Sediawati, the governmental head of the organizing committee, underlined the non-aligned movement's function in the post-Cold War era as ushering economic cooperation among the quote-unquote South countries, following the directives highlighted in the South Commission meeting in 1992. Supankat's curatorial proposition, um, sorry, Supankat's curatorial proposition uh, of the South-South framework and affiliation followed this new categorization of the global that, as reiterated by Sapankat, takes economic realities and cooperation of the developing world into account. While the exhibition was met with mixed receptions in Indonesia with many artists and activists accusing the curators of siding with the authoritarian regime, Sapankat contended that the events contributed to drawing attention to and generating knowledge on contemporary art, particularly the ones developed in the South. From the perspective of the South, they were still primarily perceived as non-existent by institutions in the West. Supankat's reassertion of multi-modernism also ep epitomizes the works by key historians, artists, and curators of modern Asian art in the late 1980s in forging new platforms and frameworks for recognizing modern Asian art histories. Many artists and works featured at the second uh, Asia-Pacific Triennial in 1996 from Southeast Asia were part of the non-aligned exhibition. A network of artists, curators, and scholars working on contemporary art was steadily formed since the initial proliferation of exhibitions on Asian and Southeast Asian art in Japan and Australia. Flooded Tatuan notes that Arahmayani's performance, Handle Without Care, which accompanied the installations titled Nation for Sale and Sacred Coke, uh, shown in this uh, APT, is a metaphor for the realities of the region, where nations were selling, quote unquote, everything they have, including their country and culture, in order to take part and benefit from global capitalism. Aramayani's performance in Balamis Dance Attire is a tongue-in-cheek commentary, and perhaps her self-implication of presenting, quote unquote, otherness as a fetish and a commodity in a, in a global com contemporary art world. 
a caveat that Sopankar identified in his essay written for APT, and a trap that Caroline Turner, as the curator of APT, uh, sought to avoid. Armayani's practices continued to be global after APT 1996, as she continued to tackle global social political issues related to religion and environmental con concerns, as shown in her 11 June 2002 installation, and her ongoing nomadic and community-based Proyek Bandera, or the Flag Project, that she started in 2006, and most recently recreated at the Istanbul Biennial uh, last year. From the 90s onward, Ramayani's and her works have been part of the propositions uh, as they bolster the imaginations of the contemporary from the South, which include a critical engagement with social political issues faced by post-colonial nation states after the failure of the Third World Project and with religion, ritual, and tradition. Apinan Boshananda noted in the text for the uh, contemporary art uh, in Asia Tradition Tension Exhibition in New York, that Aramayani's works, quote, conflates the obsession with rituals and the superficialities that generally accompany them, unquote. But as remarked by uh, Rashid Arain, this obsession and, quote, unquote, dangerous infatuations also seem to be part of the condition of difference and condition of acceptance for contemporary art from the South to be, quote, unquote, global. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Hural Qasimi and Salah Hassan for organizing the, the March meeting and putting together such a, a rich program. And I want to thank our presenters today for their really uh, uh, provocative and thoughtful uh, uh, papers, which are impossible to summarize okay, <laughs> because of their, um, uh, uh, the, the approaches they take. Um, uh, there were a, a few overarching themes that I thought built uh, quite well from the from the first panel this morning, uh, which uh, well, you know, one has to, of course, do with the question of temporality and and uh, placing, you know, uh, uh, and a kind of periodization, which uh, we did discuss in the first panel, but um, and in in the sense that this panel is supposed to be the like, you know, the, the first panel was on the 60s, and this is from the 70s and onwards, and uh, but of course we know that while historical benchmarks are kind of important for us to kind of make give some structure to history and to kind of uh, narration of uh, events. Uh, we all know that uh, this is especially complicated in the case of, uh, you know, the practice of art because it, uh, art as we know is, uh, you know, is, uh, is marked by recursivity, by prolepsis, by kind of uh, both forward looking and kind of in a sense uh, recovering the past in, in very complicated ways. And uh, I think that comes across very well in in many of these papers with, uh, with Patrick in, 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 by looking at uh, um, the relation between May, May 1968 and then, but also 1980 with, with the example of Guangzhou. Uh, but even more provocatively, I think, with, uh, with Patrick's, um, in, in some sense, uh, engagement with the, you know, German expressionism, uh, but also their journeys into, into Bali and, and Southeast Asia, and really the vexed question of primitivism, okay, that, uh, uh, you know, to what degree is, uh, and, and really the birth of modernism, right, in relation to kind of primitivism. I think that's a, uh, an important um, a set of concerns that we can continue to, uh, to, to revisit in thoughtful ways. The question of infrastructure also, of course, comes up because, uh, uh, you know, as Patrick, um, you know, Patrick himself being a, a curator, um, uh, you know, in a sense, juxtaposing the, uh, you know, the work of uh, Okwi uh, in relation to four Southeast Asian curators, Jim Supankat, Raza Piyazasa, uh, Apinan Poshyananda, and Romando Albani, but his own work as well as a, as, as, as a curator. So I'm thinking, you know, as a fellow traveler with Okwi, uh, you know, with many of these, um, uh, but, but from a Southeast Asian kind of uh, and global perspective, what is the relation of kind of, let's say, curation, its relation to institutions, and, its, uh, and the question of the global. I think uh, these are all uh, things that we can uh, kind of, in a sense, uh, revisit. Um, um, infrastructure, of course, is a very central concern for, uh, um, uh, for Anthony's paper, and, uh, you know, who's uh, looking directly at, the, at the, both the paradoxes and the and, and the openings afforded by 
you know, by, by the biennial, which is, uh, I mean, of course, the biennial has, you know, continues to be criticized for, for you know, for the five reasons that he, um, he outlined, but even in these reasons, he, he suggests openings and possibilities. Um, the final possibility he, he discusses is the, is the example of pause from the 2002 Guangzhou um, exhibition in, you know, in the sense of having um, artists, um, cooperatives, and, um, and um, institutions be uh, given a platform to, to articulate their, their work. Um, and in some ways, I can't help but think you know, how this prefigures the document of last year. Okay, so that's... Uh, another set of concerns that we, we can visit. Um, Atre reminds us of the really the, the long reach of Bandung, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, kind of decolonization by looking at Berkeley's uh, third world le left uh, uh, forum and uh, the, the coming together of really, you know, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, the darker people, if you will, from diverse backgrounds uh, in terms of articulating both changes in, um, in curriculum, but also um, and syllabi, uh, being very aware of what's happening in you know globally, uh, and um, also thinking about how the universities that we structures that we inherit today were, in some sense, reformulated you know during this uh, period of the 60s and 70s, and how important programs and departments like ethnic studies or global art you know the study of global art and so on remains an important uh, you know. Uh, a dimension that we don't take for that we should not take for granted, but think of it in the history, in the longer history of struggle for, for scholarly recognition. Um, in some ways, Anisha returns us back to Bandung, but uh, you know, the, in, in some ways, the the journey that Bandung took in Indonesia itself, in in ways that um, perhaps uh, you know are uh, unexpected, but also in some ways confirmed to. Uh, the restructuring of the world, uh, you know, through neoliberalism, through the demise of the third world project, and into uh, a, a future that is both fraught, uncertain, but perhaps uh, uh, also holds possibilities. Um, uh, institutions play a key role in in uh, in the in the globalization of Asian art, especially the Asia Pacific Triennial in 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 Australia in the nine, 1990s, but also the role that Singapore. Um, as the Singapore Art Museums have played, as well as Fukuoka Asian Art Museum in, in, um, in the 90s and, and so on. Uh, but by, by, see, by tracing the really closely the, 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 the work of Arahme um, and looking at her practice uh, as it intersects both with questions of liberation, but also the question of political Islam that becomes more and more kind of urgent, you know, with the uh, with, with, with the Iranian Revolution in 1979, whose effects, of course, you know, she traces to, to Indonesia itself. But there are other benchmarks, which the Rushdi affair in, you know, in the 80s, but, and then, uh, then September 11, 2001. In a way, you know, all of these are benchmarks that bring the question of global Islam in, in the forefront, okay, and uh, which also, in a sense, uh, are sometimes seen as counterposed to the earlier, uh, uh, you know, third world liberation. Um, and uh, this is something that, um, 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 uh, that, that, that other scholars have also kind of outlined, right? Um, and uh, what's significant for me about um, uh, the practice of Arahmehani is that it's, in some ways, it's a, it's a highly reflexive and critical practice that reflects both on the conservative and kind of, um, you know, uh, notions of, you know, uh, kind of Islam. Uh, but is equally critical of um, of consumerism, of spectacle, of uh, of uh, of, uh, of the marking, or mar marking and marketing of kind of uh, you know you know uh, ethnicity and difference that characterize um, you know a lot of what goes and under the name of uh, global art. Um, so with these, I will. Uh, so these are not really you know in some sense questions, but uh, perhaps my my summary of the the papers. Um, and uh, perhaps some, um, uh, some key issues that uh, struck me as being significant that, that, um, that range across these four panels. So with that, I'll invite the, the audience to, uh, to, to please ask questions. So um, when you ask your questions, you know, you are allowed two sentences maximum. Please do not give commentary, okay? Ask a, a very clear and direct question. Uh, thank you. <laughs> 
two, two, three sentences for comments. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so the floor is open. Okay, two snappy questions. Number one is, um, I would like to know from a historical point of view why the Bandung conference took place in Bandung. I actually don't know why. <laughs> um, and what the implications of that were, it happening in Indonesia, Bandung, for politics and you know, cultural sort of non-alignments. Um, or, sorry, alignments with the non-aligned movement. My second question is, um, okay, how to be concise, <laughs> so. Um, we've talked a lot about um, solidarity movements across different marginalized people in the 60s, 70s, 80s. It strikes me that in our current climate that there is more clamoring for specificity within particular marginalized groups. And I am wondering about this question of solidarity across uh, underrepresented and, and marginalized peoples. And I'll just take one example to illustrate. So in the UK, the black arts movement in the 80s was used to encompass um, both African diaspora, uh, East Asian, South Indian, whereas now we see people really wanting the term black art to belong more specifically to African and Caribbean diasporas in the UK. And I'm just interested in hearing some of the panelists' point of view on that different climate today and where does that put transnational um, solidarity, yeah, today. Also, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, um, I'm Melanie Pocock, and I'm a curator and artistic director of exhibitions at Icon Gallery in Birmingham, UK. The question about Bandung is an incredibly interesting one. Um, in a way, um, the fact that the meeting took place in Bandung is incidental. Bandung was not the first shais. Um, and Nehru in particular writes extensively about why he doesn't want it at Bandung. Uh, prior to the Bandung meeting, several other meetings take place uh, behind closed doors. But it would appear that the decision to host in Bandung had something to do with drawing Sukarno in, who was not entirely convinced um, by the bid for, for a third way. And, and the other, other, uh, the others who were involved in the closed door meetings actually did not want it in Indo Indonesia. Um, and there are there are many many archival records that uh, very clearly demonstrate a, a kind of a terse relationship, even among the few who masterminded the conference. I wonder if I could just add very quickly to that, that it's sort of interesting thinking about this idea of a bandung trope that emerges. So there's disagreement behind closed doors, every leader, every big man wanting to be the sort of key figure the, 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 um, within the, the, the possibility of a movement, but then giving this impression of wonderful solidarity in public. So there's this incredible series of photographs that Chris Lee has written about very well. Um, called the Bandung Walk, where all the, the, the leaders kind of parade through the streets of Bandung to the, to the hall, which is then recreated, actually, just thinking about how a Bandung trope emerges of this kind of mix of tension and apparent solidarity. In 2015, with the leaders of Indonesia and China now becoming the key figures for a renewed Bandung Walk, which I think is sort of speaks to a different um, set of circumstances under which we're 
we're living today and what that might mean in terms of whose solidarities, which solidarities and directed outwards to whom. I want to add to that. Um, which is exactly why Bandung is such a wonderful uh, symbol, because it captures fully all of the conflicts that mark a global uh, solidarity, much of which we don't actually talk about. Um, what's also, at least for me, compelling about both the concept of the third world and Bandung is the fact that we know the very many ways in which they failed. So there's nothing in stake in um, resuscitating the political movement. Uh, but there's a lot in stake in um, the non-state actors who took up the project. Um, and so there is the possibility rather, in, rather than the march of the leaders, as it were. Would anyone like to answer the black British in question, the identity issue? I might talk about the 1980s and sort of leading up to the other story, which was the extraordinary exhibition that Rashid Arain um, put together at the Haywood in 89, which was focused precisely on um, black British art, which encompassed so many different kinds of backgrounds. And there was a lot of debate and dispute, as we know, about um, whether somebody from South Asia, for instance, should be framed within the notion of blackness. And a lot of resistance even then to that that has, uh, you know, we're seeing it persist today, but also trying to see other ways of thinking about specificity that isn't isolated, that isn't turned into a silo, but can still have its connections, whether it be through through struggle, through dispossession, through whatever. Um, and so that, that framework now, the, 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 the uh, sort of mantra now, um, not so much of politics through identity, but identity through politics and that sort of sharing of what that might entail, what that those politics might entail has become a very interesting um, difference, perhaps, from what somebody as extraordinary as Rashid was even thinking about in the 1980s. But that's only from an observational standpoint, from, from my side. But also to just to add that minority identities are, you know, they're, they're in formation and uh, they're a negotiation between kind of, you know, uh, communities and, uh, la you know, the larger society and they're always inflected by power. I think uh, somebody like Stuart Hall is good on, you know, thinking about, you know, he has this essay, Old and New Ethnicities. So I think it's a, it's a good reminder that, you know, our identities are not primordial in that sense and that they, uh, that they can shift according to, you know, situation and time. So. I got the mic, so I'm, I get to ask very quickly short questions. Hi, I'm Babish. Um, from the last panel, thank you for your presentations. I'm very glad if Tehad uh, brought up the figure of the minority and the minor. Um, so as you have Bandung and the big men of the post-colonial world and Bandung coming up, you also have the formation of majoritarian communities and this was indicated in the last presentation, Islamist majoritarianisms and other kinds of majoritarianism and the creation of uh, post-colonial minorities. So I was wondering also to uh, um, uh, one of the presentations around the th the concept of the third world, which which gets invoked, uh, and Bandung, which gets evoked as a trope uh, in conversation, while it creates a series of solidarities and link interlinkages. In which ways does it also get? Um, invoked to create various forms of illegibilities and, uh, and pushing, uh, pushing to the side certain things that, for example, in a post-colonial na national imagination, uh, for example, uh, might be seen as, I mean, uh, many times in post-colonial states, you did have uh, any kind of internal dissent uh, interpreted as, for example, imperial or foreign intervention. Um, which undermines the third world this project is, is just one example. Um, so if you could reflect on, on some of the, not just the possibilities that are opened up by the concept of the third world in Bandung, but the differences that are perhaps shut down. Anyone would like to address this? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, let me respond to that anecdotally. Um, 
as it may have been obvious, my own work focuses on the Bandung era from the interwar period to the 1960s, um, and hence my interest in the Third World Liberation Front, which kind of draws a much longer arc. Um, my work focuses on South Asia and India in part particular, where while the concept of the Third World and the non-alignment were reported upon extensively, it never entered intellectual vocabulary. So when I was doing my research, when I would ask people, so is this something that you were actively thinking about? They would say yes, but they would never invoke Banduk or the Third World. Um, I think it becomes a trope res retrospectively. Um, and these were a, a motley cast of characters, artists, uh, writers, intellectuals, who were actively engaged in the Third World project as we understand it now. Um, which is to say that even in the 1960s and the 70s, there's a very clear distinction between the state project of non-alignment and Bandung. Um, Third World as um, an opposition to the to the bipolarity of the uh, of the sec uh, of of the Cold War, um, and also third world in the in its in so far as it plays into UN politics, but at the same time, there's a very conscious attempt by intellectuals, artists, and others to distance themselves from this political vocabulary, yet to speak in the in speak in the spirit of the third world, if you will, um, and. Among these, this constituency, um, there were many who, um, who protested against state oppression. In South Asia, we, we know that, that in the 1960s and the 1970s, already there are internal, uh, there is a lot of internal strife. Um, already, uh, at least in India, there are colonies. Um, and so, so this happens pretty quickly. But at the same time, even in the 1960s and the 70s, there is a sense um, in which third world is an intellectual possibility. Not in a political sense, not in an economic sense, but in an intellectual sense. And so this fissure, I think, is something that we have to account for um, when invoking Bandung or the third world today. Yeah, just a, it's a difficult question, but this is a quick observation. Reflecting on the the term non-alignment, I sense an overinvestment in, in negation. And what might be repressed is the, okay, this theory of implication, which I'm interested in as, as evidenced in, in my presentation. So I think that's one uh, thing we, we can elaborate further, this idea of uh, implication as opposed to, to, to negation. Uh, I think from the theoretical perspective that might uh, be uh, pro productive in, in annotating uh, practices uh, in, in Southeast Asia and also uh, cultural production. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Naminata Diabate. I'm a senior fellow at the Africa Institute. This is a conceptual question, and it's inviting us to go to the title of the panel. And I'm looking specifically at the status of exception. And I would like you, from your own points of departure and concept, how can we think about the ambiguity at the heart of the notion of a state of exception, which is not necessarily based on pre-existing criteria, but based on the sovereign decision. So, the, the ambiguity, how can you relate that? And can you say more about your own you know, locations and conceptual maps? It's for me, you know, it's for the panelists, I think. Uh, I mean, states, you know, definitely states of exception to, you know, what is, in other words, we have, we have certain expectations from the way history might unfold, and then we find that that's not the case. And uh, 
Uh, one can, uh, you know, at, at a provocative level, we can say that we are, you know, since really the 70s onwards, we are living in various states of exceptions in the sense that history is not unfolding the way that we would like it to, okay, <laughs> in, in various places in the world. And uh, the same goes for something like the states of emergency. I mean, the title, of course, is provocative, but I think there's something to be, uh, there, there is something, uh, you know, worthwhile in terms of engaging, you know, with, with, with these. Uh, this also came up earlier when Kamran mentioned about the, the lack of a, a unified horizon for to aspire towards, right? So, so uh, you know, with that lack, we are left with fragments. And we are left with uh, fragments of history, fragments of utopian aspirations that we try to put together. So I think that, what generally would be the sensibility that informs, you know, a lot of artistic practice, uh, but of course it changes and and and, and you know from uh, a location and subjectivity and community and so on. Uh, so just as a very brief uh, kind of uh, a gloss on that. But if the panelists would like to expound on it in other ways, please go ahead. I think it's a really really interesting um, question. So thank you for raising it because, and I'm just going to be speaking out loud here, um, thinking through some of the, 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 the challenges that I've actually found um, with this panel is that uh, for something that has a title of states of exception and states of emergency, it's been that question of violence from this morning is it's just been eradicated almost. You know, where is the, 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 the toothiness? Where is the, 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 the grip of precisely these um, horrific states usually um, where law is suspended, uh, anarchy may reign or, or violence um, in various trajectories operates. Are the, the forms or the frames or the exhibitions, the context we're thinking about, what happens with violence in relation to them? Because they all seem fairly gentle. Um, is it a working through of those circumstances, perhaps after the fact, sometimes as with Adamayani, during the fact of, of a, a, a persistent state of exception? Do exhibitions, even perhaps the, the, the work of art, offer a state of exceptionalism within that? Not just exceptional in the sense of elitist, but actually a, a, a space, a time in which something else may emerge. Um, is that also a different kind of, of state of exception uh, that we could think through and think with? And I think that's what a lot of artists um, have been trying to explore, is how can art persist within these um, pernicious states in ways that allow not only for reflection at the time, but possibilities for afterwards. But what do we do as historians then to allow that urgency and that violence perhaps to still be there in the work we're looking at? Um, it's a question mark for me because I, I sort of feel like that for the most part, maybe Atria's talk is, is slightly different here. Um, that violence kind of slid away. I took state of exemption and state of emergency quite literally. I entered it through Carl Smith, who writes about states of exception. He is, of course, write, writing about the rise of Nazi Germany. Uh, but he re he's writing about it in the 1920s, um, when, um, when Nazi Germany hasn't quite um, is only, artic only just beginning to articulate itself. Um, so when Carl Smith describes states of exception in that, within that paradigm, um, he's also projecting uh, to imagine a future outside it. Um, and I entered state of emergency through Agamben, um, who picks up on Carl Smith and elaborates on this, on this idea of emergency. They're both write, writing specifically about dictatorships and military regimes. Um, so that's how you kind of got there. And Reagan works wonderfully with that, with that frame. Um, yeah, I think for my paper, um, I also start with um, like taking the sort of like the, the, the title of the Gip panel quite literally as well, because it starts with Aramayani's works, um, that um, the background of it is a, it was a very exceptional um, event for her to be detained, uh, especially after, I mean, particularly after uh, the 9-11. And it gave her sort of a, re a realization of the challenges that she 
faced uh, as a as a as a Muslim woman uh, from that, and, um, and it sort of uh, also informed the shift of her artistic practice uh, in the early 2000s that she began to realize that. Um, she needs to be part of a solution and not just uh, criticizing uh, the conditions. Um, so that's why there is the shift with her flag project at the end. So she works more uh, uh, with community, um, trying to um, sort of um, collaborate in, in um, solving issues uh, related to um, not only not only social political issues that uh, specifically faced by certain community, but also environmental issues. Um, so yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just really briefly, I will try to do them in three sentences, but typical of Sylvia Winter's sentences, which are actually <laughs> a whole paragraph. Anyway, I hope you accept it because you said sentences. Anyway, <laughs> one is actually just a comment to address the, the earlier uh, uh, comment about Bandung, is that I would recommend a Richard Wright book. It's called The Color Curtain, and it, because it brings a unique perspective. He is an African-American writer who's a, a former you know, communist. They still have those allegiances, uh, sitting in New York, hearing about a conference at which the US and the Soviet Union were not invited or disinvited. So he said, what a pleasure. I'm going to go to that one. So then he writes a very interesting perspective out of, from the perspective of African-Americans and also unique to him. So I, I really recommend it as one of those uh, things about Bandung that is outside the leadership of it and so forth and how it affected uh, individuals and writers uh, uh, who are interested in these issues. Um, the second comment is really about, you know, it's in response to Anissa's talk, which I really thought is very interesting, is how uh, the whole idea in post-September 11, or even pre, how there was a response to the uh, political Islam, which is, of course, here's where the subtext that you think, Anthony Gardner, uh, Anthony, that you said it was ignored. It was not, because there was an exhibitionary regime that actually created, either inside and, and Indonesia, which is what Anissa focused off of how there was an alternative, how the state dictated certain ways of exhibiting or exhibition regime in which there was a, a deliberate representation of a depoliticized Islam, a peaceful Islam, a modern Islam, a Sufi Islam, all of those things. But in the West, it's interesting, in post-September 11, most museums, and for hum human maybe reasons for uh, reasons to counter the, the official and violent, you know, a response, in, whether it's the invasion of Iraq or destruction as we see it until now, until Syria, is how the West, re, Western regime responded to the idea of political Islam and took it as a whole thing to change the map of the Middle East. So the subtext is there. What happened in the West is that there is a whole regime of, 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 of shows that try to, to kind of present an image of a moderate Islam. And it took different ways. One example is actually an interesting exhibit. It was called, um, it was at the, it's about 17 ways of seeing without boundaries. And it was uh, curated by Freshta Daftari. It actually represented the struggle between the curator who tried to kind of present a different view of the so-called Islamic art and to think of it as art from Islamic regions as a counter to the official narrative there or the preference for the certain exhibition regimes which present a Sufi Islam. So at that time, you know, Ibn Arabi and others became a Rumi, everybody citing a Rumi at that time. And then there was a preference for the calligraphic, for the work, and that's another interesting thing is that also preference for artists who critique the hijab, Muslim women, uh, and there was a whole, you know, promotion of, of certain type of feminism that goes with it. All of it, the subtext, uh, the, uh, the subtext of it is a critique of a violence or countering violence or presenting a different image of Islam uh, as in the way or in the name of art as a bridge between you know, uh, different people to present a different Islam. I hope I'm not going to <laughs> too much, but I thought that was something that's very interesting really to think about is that there is a whole exhibition regime that is 
counter to what Anissa presented internally is that in the West, that was, that was for a long time. Remember one thing, and I, I can cite this as the case, is the case of Shirin Nashat work, which uses images of women and the gun. Shirin faced a lot of criticism, and even almost uh, violence in, in terms of rhetoric as a response to her work, which was totally misunderstood because it, it deals with something totally different and it's, it's internal, it's, a, it's kind of a, a critique that is from within as an Iranian artist, but at that time it was viewed as a, a counter to the, uh, uh, it was like a violence and a, a pr promoting you know, violent image and so forth, the gun and the Muslim women. So thank you, I hope I didn't take too much of the heart. Oh, and just to add to that actually, um, Anisha, in your, in your other work, you actually, I mean, in, in your presentation, Peru's uh, emerges as a kind of a foil, okay, to Arhamani. But I think in your, uh, in your other work, you've actually done really close readings of Peru's and also shown the complexity of his practice and how he, he is a kind of a forging a modernism that, is, uh, that, uh, that also looks at, you know, Islam in very complex ways and also looks at local kind of traditions. So I think... Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, while he may emerge as a foil in an institutional context in his own work, he, uh, his work is quite interesting, I think, as, you, as, as you've shown. Um, um, other questions, comments? Uh, oh, yes, Kamran. Yes. No, thank you. Um, um, I think the, sh the, just a comment on exception, I think Schmittian argument in the, uh, in the 20s as he develops is, I think, Exception is intrinsic to the liberal uh, modality. It's not, uh, you know, so one has to understand it that 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 a democratic liberalism is, you know, it's not an afterthought or a moral question, but it, there is a exclusionary and exceptional principle within it that one has to understand. And for Schmidt, exception eventually in the early 30s, even before National Socialist come into power, is there to sort of curtail chaos and create a much more uh, powerful presidency and the legislature. So in a sense, it's a very complicated history in Schmittian, uh, and, and it sort of also tells us that liberalism doesn't, it, the exclusionary principle in liberalism is intrinsic to it. And, and, and so one, but my question, my thing actually, I was thinking about uh, Patrick Flores's th raising the, and this is different from the, my my thoughts on, on, on exception, is the issue of the primitive and the bringing up of German expressionism. And, and I thought that there was a parallel between that late 19th century fascination, even in anthropology, and quote unquote, in his humanism with the Pensee, well, well Levi Strauss is later, but the idea of the primitive or the Pensee Savage or the Tristis Topic, that, but you see it in Boaz, you see it in Bachoven, you see it in, uh, other anthropologists who are really, and you see it in Marx, in terms of uh, the sort of, you know, early communism and the kind of German romanticism about a classless society. So there is a certain kind of a Western fascination in a humanist way when, when there is an expansion of colonialism and all kinds of oppressions are going, and your parallel in the late 19th century, in tw late 20th century is the uh, accumulation of non of the global South art in the moment of structural adjustment and violence and things like that. There are certain kinds of interesting parallels going on in terms of, on all in the name of some kind of liberal inclusionary principle, which we know is a problematic uh, idea, and, and humanism, right? And which in itself has problematic. So those two, and then the issue in that, that um, Anthony Gardner talks about, and also Atre, uh, Atre, Gupta talks about is the way that how do we mediate this? And then there's a whole sort of issue of a certain kind of pedagogy which has to be then thought about in a non-hierarchical sense. And where is that kind of, you know, I'm thinking of Rancière's ignorant schoolmaster actually, and the way in which the non-hierarchical pedagogy can work or does not work. Right, because it is about, you're not, shun, I mean, even Bandung does not shun the West. I mean, the colonial states are very much formed within the sort of modernist uh, uh, legacy of a particular kind of emancipatory liberalism, or whatever you call it. I mean, liberalism in terms of Marx also being history of, of liberalism. So I'm saying this whole issue of non-hierarchical pedagogy is a question that 
I think our panelists are also trying to tackle with that. What are the other modalities in which a more egalitarian and a more just and a more sort of, uh, you know, and I was thinking about that, you know, can the ignorant also be a pedagogical master? And, and that contradicts that paradox and other paradox perhaps coming from <laughs> uh, Gardner's work. So sorry I'm going on, but I think this is a very rich argument that all of you are presenting, and I just wanted to thank you. So I just wanted to build on uh, you know, that comment and ask actually both uh, Patrick and Anthony. Uh, so Patrick, I mean, I just want to put some pressure on you about your recovery of primitivism, okay? So um, I mean, I, I, am, I am myself very sympathetic to Western artists who, who, who open up to the world and learn from it. So I think that's a very important moment in which modernism actually emerges through that encounter, right? So uh, on the other hand, the problem with, you know, that early 20th century primitivism and also Bali, of course, is a very is a hot house for you know also the, uh, for the forging of anthropological kind of you know notions. Um, is that it sees the rest of the world as uh, primordial and fixed, right? It's not that it's different. I, th I think the difference is fine, and they negotiate it in different ways. But but the, the fact that they see it as primordial, uh, essentialist, you know, cyclical and fixed, right? So uh, so how do you kind of get around that, right? In terms of your interest in uh, Walter Spees and others, okay? And or for Anthony, I think you, I mean, you presented five what you consider to be paradoxes, yet you provided openings to all of them. However, okay, your heart seems to be in the possibility in the last, uh, you know, which is, which is, which is the Pulse uh, exhibition at uh, 2002 Guangzhou, which is basically social, social practice and participatory practice. So are you suggesting that that is the best way forward, okay, as, as a provocation? Difficult questions, but to the, to the point of uh, horizontality and uh, like uh, horizontal pedagogy, uh, my proposition is that relay, the relay of the artist curator collective. So I think in the theorization, and historicization of that relay, there, there can you know we can cobble together something uh, to 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 respond to this desire for uh, horizontality in relation to German expressionism. <laughs> if Dicker is a recent, it's a recent project, uh, but it's a fascinating one. Uh, I was in Germany last just this December, so it's fresh in my mind. So I wanted to maybe I could loop it into the my earlier project of the artist curator. But uh, I think the uh, idea of curatorial thinking uh, should inform art history. And this is, I think, what I'm doing here, to, to uh, not really to treat, to treat uh, German expressionism in isolation, but to imbricate it in a kind of historiography that will uh, produce something else. That's why I toss into the bowl these uh, eccentric and problematic cases, like German Expressionism, Walter Spies, and so on and so forth. So I, 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 I am attracted to that, com that complication, yeah. Sort of bouncing off Patrick there too, because I wouldn't say it's about socially engaged work. I don't think any of the uh, groupings or collectives or institutions that I that we see in pause would necessarily identify in that way. They're artist-run spaces. They're you know, collective spaces. Um, I think that point about uh, non-hierarchical pedagogy is actually a much more interesting way of thinking about this because it, we, we sort of shed some of the uh, expectations and again those tropes, including the bundle tropes associated with socially engaged practice and so forth. But if we start using different kinds of terminologies and ways of, of entering into and, and, and exploring um, those histories, then I think we come to that point which Patrick is also raising, which was the other provocation for us, not just states of exception and emergency, but how do we write art histories coming from these uh, positionalities and from these quite unstable positionalities at times as well. And I think that's, that's um, very much connected with it, is, is having to rethink some of these terms in their minutiae in their details and in the tensions and questions and problems posed then posing themselves to us now um, as we try to navigate what 
not only what these histories might be, but what their urgencies are going forward. And, and the fact that uh, Patrick raised Rungrupa, I also showed some work by Rungrupa, and thinking about the quite racist um, denigration of Rungrupa uh, in relation to the last documenta, um, I think shows that these, these questions um, and the, 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 the another, maybe another paradox, but certainly a, a challenging intersection between different kinds of identity positions and the ways that they have been uh, legislated that reinforce not just a xenophobia but a racism within the cultural spheres, and particularly in Europe, but elsewhere as well. I think that shows the urgency of some of the things that we're looking at. So it's uh, five o'clock, and I have been told that our time is up. Um, so please join me in thanking our presenters today. Thank you.